is big into uh, a kind of hermetic autonomy, a kind of um, existence of a world of forms or a kind of perfection that's sealed off. Um, so anywho, uh, uh, Will Wright in his planning uh, for The Sims stated that uh, it actually began with an earlier uh, lesser known title called Sim Ant. Is anyone familiar with Sim Ant? It's, okay, it's not, this is the crowd that it's not lesser known for. Um, it's a simulation of an ant colony, right? Not uh, an ant, it's an ant colony. Um, and uh, uh, there is a human in the game, he's kind of an, antag an antagonist uh, for the ant colony. Um, and uh, he operates, according to Will Wright, according to traditional top-down artificial intelligence. Data comes into this human, it makes choices based on that data, and uh, then uh, uh, takes action accordingly. The uh, ants, however, manifest what uh, Will Wright calls a distributed environmental intelligence based on virtual pheromone trails. Uh, and so in preparing for The Sims, he was uh, looking back at this, and uh, he stated, I began wondering, could we build a more robust simulation of human behavior if we adopted this ant model, where we distribute the intelligence not through the agents, but through the environment? Uh, he turned to uh, Christopher Alexander's A Pattern Language, uh, the text. Um, this is something he elsewhere calls um, uh, halfway between psychology and architecture. This work is, uh, in fact, about how built environments um, affect human behavior and psyche. Um, and uh, uh, from this uh, research, Wright uh, created what he calls the proximity pheromone model. And that is the core uh, AI in the Sims. It's, it's how the actual Sim beings, the Sims, um, operate. Uh, basically what happens is Sims actions are largely determined by their uh, proximity and susceptibility to the objects that surround them. It's, it's, kind, of, um, it's, a, it's kind of a Gibsonian affordian, affordances situation where the uh, chair and the toilet and the mop all say, I can do this, I can do this. And uh, Sims kind of uh, float on this uh, uh, this milieu. Um, and so uh, uh, let me uh, move this forward. This is what gives the talk its title. Uh, Will Wright said, uh, what we did was make the people really dumb and make the environment and the objects really smart. Uh, so the question becomes, um, where is identity in all this, right? Where, where's the Sims identity, uh, particularly if they're operating in this kind of model? Uh, Sims identities are predicated on their personalities, which are basically specialized filters for these environmental broadcasts. Sims don't have what we would consider to be conventional free will. They don't reason about their environment. They basically uh, select or deflect uh, these environmental influences. Uh, so, so to untangle the implications of the Sims Act acts of filtering on identity, we might look at Mark uh, C. Taylor's discussion of screening in the moment of complexity. Uh, near the end of his text, uh, Taylor states that he is not the author of the book because the ideas, words, and concepts that appear in it are not solely his own, but an amalgamation of other sources. This probably reminds us of Bart's death of the author, and it uh, is, is clearly resonant with that. Uh, for Taylor, the self is a screen, that's what he calls it, using the double meaning of screen to both keep out and also to project, right, like that. Uh, so for him, a, a self is a screen. Uh, a filter uh, upon which influences are projected. And similarly, similarly for Sims, object broadcasts, they don't consciously contend with one another, right? They're not fighting, but a process of selection does occur. Uh, Sims screen the chosen from the deflected and draw their own identities from those acts of filtering. Now, crucially, it's not just inside the magic circle of the, Sven of the Sims where this is uh, uh, relevant. Uh, the players beyond the screen are also incorporated into what becomes a, a wider network. Uh, journalist David Brooks discuss, discusses how physical and digital personas mingle through their shared investment in virtual commodities. Uh, he claims that a player's first reaction in the Sims world, and this is somewhat encouraged, uh, this world of infinite possibilities is to consume, to quote, nest and decorate. Um, Brooks labels this a virtual hedonism, a, delici a delicious set of pleasures and sensations that apparently come from imagining what floorings would go with what wall surfaces, from selecting blouses and boleros, from mixing and matching and combining. Uh, he goes on to describe the real effect of these intangible items on human players, and there's a longer quotation here that's worth quoting. Uh, this is something Brooks recorded from a player. 
Uh, and see how the public bubbles with enthusiasm in Sims sites devoted to fashion discussions you find yourself among people in a shopping frenzy. Authentic Victorian wallpaper is now available. And here's a new site with pet gyms for your little Sims gerbil to run around in. Oh, and something very, 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 very special. One Sims nut enthusiasts on Party Sims, a brand new portable TV collection. So reading Brooks' statements here, it's difficult to discern who's more impacted by these objects, right? The Sims or the, or the players. Uh, but it'd be imprecise to view this as just a simple materialism. Uh, a major part of The Sims uh, is content creation, right? The ability to generate uh, not just virtual beings, but also virtual goods. Wright states that before uh, releasing the first Sims game, the Maxis software team uh, spent approximately an extra year making it thoroughly customizable. And they released modification tools before the game shipped. And early after the game's release, some 80 to 90% of the game's content was actually user generated, according to their own statistics, uh, and circulated through sites such as the Sims Exchange. So what we see in uh, Sims players is a fusion of consumption and production media scholar uh, Ken Perlin calls conducing. Uh, by making, exchanging, and using objects, players develop an evolving system that transcends this gap between virtual and, and physical, particularly when economies uh, come into this as well. Uh, players create and, and share these virtual beings and objects uh, which assert their influence over other virtual beings and objects and as Brooks shows us, um, on players themselves. Uh, so players thereby are not simple consumers but they're vital parts of this broader network of, of circulation. So to understand the implications of this hybridism, we must reassess our, our understanding of the human-object relationship. Uh, the book, The Meaning of Things, uh, Domestic Symbols in the Self by sociologists Mihaly, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi and Eugene Rocheberg Helton, uh, tough names, um, provide, uh, provides an extended investigation into the association between objects and identity. Uh, the authors depict the mutually constitutive relationship of objects and users through their statement that the self is, quote, to a large extent a reflection of the things with which it interacts. Thus objects also make and use their makers and users. And they mean this literally, it's not a metaphor for them. Um, for them, a self or, or a, an identity isn't really extricable from its environment. Uh, Csikszentmihalyi and Rocheberg Halton's assertion is demonstrated through empirical evidence collected through field interviews, and it's also predicated on the theoretical groundwork of Arendt and Heidegger. Um, Arendt sees the human-made world as separate from the natural planet and positions the human-made world of things as the objective grounding of self in opposition to the uh, apathy of a disinterested natural world. This is unusual. It's very anti-romantic, right? The natural world isn't objective, it's the stuff we make, that's objective. The natural world uh, cares nothing about us, it's, um, it's separate in some way. Um, she states uh, against the uh, subjectivity of men uh, stands the uh, objectivity of the man-made world rather than the sublime indifference of an untouched nature. Uh, Csikszentmihalyi and Rocheberg Halton see in this perspective a connection with Heidegger's concept of dwelling in the world. Uh, and they conclude, uh, these arguments, this is Csikszentmihalyi and Rocheberg Halton, these arguments imply that men and women make order in their selves, i.e. retrieve their identity, by first creating and then interacting with the material world. The nature of that transaction will determine to a great extent the kind of person that emerges. Thus the things that surround us are inseparable from who we are. The material objects we use are not just tools we can pick up and discard at our convenience. They constitute the framework of experience that gives order to our otherwise shapeless selves. And their interview subjects really articulate this stance. Um, these, their, their subjects to me are uh, kind of more potent than, uh, than their uh, conclusions. Um, this comes from a 62-year-old a grandmother using what they call well-chosen words. She states that uh, her objects represent my hard-earned final composite identity. Uh, another subject states of her treasured possessions that if I didn't have them, I probably wouldn't be the same person. They sort of mold my personality. Another interviewee contends that everybody's made up of different things. They're part of me in the respect that they make up my personality. And the youngest interviewee in the pool states simply and profoundly, all of my special things make me feel like I'm part of the world. Um, it's kind of, when we look at it like this, it seems a little heavy handed, but I can almost guarantee we all have some of this, right? We all have precious objects. If I took away your photos or my iPad, you'd be a different person, right? 
Um, so all of these people, and perhaps us, acknowledge uh, their profound imbrication in a network of objects and how this entanglement shapes their identities. Uh, so unseating humans from the conventional position as a discrete rational agent and tying identities to objects, it's somewhat counterintuitive, um, but there are those who, who discuss this. Uh, in Mind, Self, and Society, pragmatist philosopher George Herbert Mead argues that objects and other humans external to the self, they function identically. Uh, he states that it's possible for inanimate objects, no less than for other human organisms, to form parts of the generalized and organized, the completely socialized other for any uh, given human individual, insofar as he responds to such uh, objects socially or in a social fashion. Uh, rhetorician Kenneth Burke likewise acknowledges that although uh, a belief in a distinction between human actions and object motions, right, this just moves, it's not conscious, he says this is necessary to function, but it's also illusory. It's, it's not real. Uh, what we see in these uh, splits and others, um, uh, a unification of external beings and objects, it preserves the I, right? It's, it's kind of everything outside of the I is equated, but somehow I'm... I'm uh, cut off from all of that. Uh, however, other thinkers reject this preservation. Uh, in the biological sciences, uh, Dawkins' the selfish gene and Matt Ridley's genome, uh, they both argue that the self isn't a unity, it's, it's really a, a collective or a colony of genes or cells or, or, or something along those lines. Uh, scholars in distributed or extended cognition build upon this sort of perspective. Uh, Edward Hutchins' cognition in the wild points to the relationship between sailors, their instruments, and their ship uh, to demonstrate how humans and objects are interdependent. Uh, this leads Hutchins to assert that cognition is best understood as an entity distributed amongst humans and non-human parts situated in an environment. Uh, thus, it's a fallacy to locate thought or identity solely in the human brain because these sorts of things, uh, these concepts only make sense uh, through interactions with a, a larger world. Complexity theory, uh, theorist Andy Clark in his book Being There similarly contends that the adaptive success of humans, indeed the very characteristic that defines them, is their ability to incorporate the environment into their acts of cognition. Uh, Clark speaks of the extended mind, that's his, his terminology, uh, which is an ephemeral entity emerging from the interactions of our own biology with the physical world. Clark calls the mind leaky, uh, and says that it mingles shamelessly with the environment. His big term is the skin, the skin bag, um, that whoever we are, it doesn't stop the uh, perimeter of our skin. Uh, and Catherine Hales, drawing upon the work of Hutchins and Clark in Flesh and Metal, describes their views of the self as systemic, meaning that the acts that define humankind are distributed throughout the environments in which humans move and work and are actuated, this is a quotation, by a variety of actors, only some of which are human. And this cognitive distribution that they're discussing, this manifests explicitly in Will Wright's discussions of The Sims. Uh, Wright explains uh, there are certain things that we cannot just simulate, or that we just cannot simulate on a computer, but on the other hand, that people are very good at simulating in their, uh, simulating in their heads. So we just take that part of the simulation and offload it from the computer into the player's head. Uh, in another interview, R uh, Wright describes this as um, using the player's imagination as the co-processor. Right? He uses that language. Uh, such a symbiotic relationship is an overt example of Andy Clark's definition of humans as natural-born cyborgs. That's the title of a, another book of his. Uh, and this is a quotation from him, not merely in the superficial sense of combining flesh and wires, but in the more profound sense of being human technology symbionts thinking and reasoning systems whose minds and selves are spread across biological brain and non-biological circuitry. Sims games blur distinction between human and machine, physical and virtual. The games evince Taylor's contention that, quote, it is no longer clear where to draw the line between mind and matter, self and other, human and machine. Mind is distributed throughout the world. Uh, so the concept of the distributed self that we uh, started with that crackles behind these authors' works and it requires a rejection of the her uh, hermetic rational entity sanctified by Descartes. Perhaps the most significant implication of viewing the self as a distributed entity is that autonomy dissolves. Uh, classifications such as human and object become not discrete categories, but useful misnomers. 
Uh, their technological, uh, terminological representations of ambiguously defined nexus regions where influences mingle, or in Taylor's words, the intersection of relations knotted in nodes. Taylor, in fact, questions if the term self even has meaning any longer as it signifies a node in a complex network of relations, which is a definition that also would apply to objects. We can see the difference here, perhaps, in a couple of diagrams I whipped up. Uh, this, for example, is... Um, we could call this a Cartesian model, right? We have self A and self B, two autonomous selves. They can interact with each other and they can interact with objects, um, but the boundaries are pretty, uh, uh, pretty sealed here. Objects don't interact with each other because they have no um, rationality. They have no ability to, uh, to be conscious. Uh, in an alternative model, we might see um, uh, selves and objects as essentially roughly defined um, regions or nexus points in a broader network of influences, right? So things here are um, defined contingently, whoa, contingently um, uh, based upon the, the interactions of, the, of this network. Um, so let's see. Uh, the unity of the, uh, of the, excuse me, the utility of viewing things uh, in this way is that it allows us to address the frag fragmentation of identity in a networked digital milieu in ways that an autonomous model can't. It makes Lucid Taylor's statement as a node in networks that are infinitely complex, I am the incarnation of World Wide Web. Uh, the omnipresence of cellular communications, instant messaging, mobile computing devices, on-demand information, entertainment, the fact that we exist in many different places and in many different pieces scattered all over networks. I saw many of us checking Facebook as these talks are going on. Um, this, uh, this demonstrates um, the, uh, um, the validity of this and changes uh, Taylor's sentiment from hyperbole into common sense. Um, a web-driven metaphor also appropriately decenters the hierarchy that may arise when viewing entities in this sort of fractal or, or micro macrocosmic relationship. What I'm saying here is folks like Dawkins and Ridley, they don't really get out of the trap by saying, well, People aren't unified. It's, it's really, it's their genes working in, 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 uh, in, in harmony because that just skips it down a level. Okay, well then what makes up genes, right? We just kind of keep going down and down trying to find the atom, um, whatever the indivisible element of identity is here. Uh, similarly, one might ask if humans uh, are colonies made from genes or cells, what makes up uh, uh, genes? Uh, and in Sim, Sims game, if Sims are made up of objects, what composes the objects? Uh, within the magic circle of the Sims, this is answered by their coded properties, but taking the whole network of the game and its players into account, the most appropriate response is that each entity is composed of other entities in a reciprocal rather than hierarchical, hierarchical relationship. Entities are only explicable through their relationship to others in the system. So we're not creating a, uh, another kind of pyramid here. Uh, or in Taylor's terms, each emerges in and through the other, and therefore neither can be reduced to the other. Uh, Taylor goes on to state, from the genome to global markets, webs act through those who appear to act on them. There is a co-determination as well as co-evolution between the individual and the web or matrix. Uh, so it's the decentered web rather than a new uh, great chain of being, you know, a new kind of building up from some uh, primary element. Um, that's the um, model of the distributed self. So I'd like to close here uh, just with a brief uh, recapitulation. Uh, what I try to do is identify a particular model of a distributed self functioning in Sims games that dissolves dis distinctions between human and object, physical and virtual. These distinctions become helpful but contingent constructs that signify ambiguously defined nodes where interactions occur. This flattening of difference casts the self as an entity both constructed and constructing. This model does not devalue the importance of humanity, nor does it remove agency. As Taylor states, quote, the decentering of the subject does not result in the dissipation of agency, but leads to nodular subjectivity in which self and other are inseparably, inseparably bound together. Uh, so the distributed self model seeks to be a productive representation of the complex relationship between selves and objects that is increasingly relevant in a postmodern digital milieu. This paper's position is that no model can claim a greater measure of objective truth than any other. Nevertheless, various models are differently appropriate to particular historical and cultural contexts. 
states Stephen Johnson, just like the clockmaker metaphors of the Enlightenment or the dialectical logic of the 19th century, the emergent worldview belongs to this moment in time, shaping our thought habits and coloring our perception of the world. Uh, my stance is that distribution engages the contemporary zeitgeist in ways that Cartesian autonomy can't, really. The value of Sims games are thus their fidelity of simulation, but not of their namesake creatures, uh, but rather of their uh, environments as a whole. The complex simulation surrounding the Sims franchise is a microcosm, a fractal depiction of the digitized, commodified network culture that spawned it. And that's it. Okay, questions? Uh. Um, I, I'd like to say thing on, something on behalf of uh, Cartesianism here. <laughs> I, I, I do ha have to say I get a little tired of people speaking as if Descartes thought that other human beings never interacted with one another, never interacted with their environments, that their minds were somehow sealed off from the rest of the world. Of course, Descartes didn't believe that. Um, and there are elements to Descartes' thought that I think probably most of us would want to give up. But I think that leaves us a long way short of buying into the kind of externalism about the mind that I think you're very enthusiastic about, a kind of externalism which says not merely the mind of, is affected by what goes on outside and that changes to the cognitive environment can enhance our uh, capacities to do things, something that Descartes would never have denied. It would have been crazy for him to have denied that. Um, and then buy into this hy hypothesis of Clark and other people that the, that the mind exists outside the head, it's distributed around. Lots, many people don't buy that. I, I, I really just want to say, no, you know, true. this is a controversial hypothesis. Um, it sounds terribly fashionable in 21st century, but I think we need some significant arguments in its favor, and not merely the assassination of a, a straw man version of Cartesianism. No, that's a fair charge. Um... Let me weasel my way out of it. I think the um, important thing is, it's not as though Descartes is going anywhere. And it's true, I mean, what I'm depicting here is a particular representation of Descartes. Um, my stance isn't that what I've presented up here is accurate. I mean, I, I perhaps need to go to greater pains that what I'm not saying here is this is how things are. What I'm saying is when we look at things through particular lenses, different things emerge. If we examine the mind as a Cartesian en entity, particular things emerge, but particular things are hidden. If we examine it as a distributed entity, particular things emerge, but particular things are, are hidden. Um, the strongest thing I could say to my claim is that I believe um, a distributed view of cognition and identity is becoming increasingly more important um, because of the time and culture in which we live. That's my strongest claim, but I make no pretense to say this is supplanting Descartes or anything like that. I don't see these things as existing in well, perhaps a Cunian uh, paradigm shift. I mean, I see these as different ways to examine phenomena. Just to follow up a bit on that point, actually, I've been working quite recently. Now I wrote a paper on distributed identity or the idea of, uh, uh, let's say, that we, we use the net, the internet, to, to expand our identity and communicate with other people. But I, I think it's a, it's, it's a bit of a, a mistake to say that, I, that because I have a Facebook page that I exist in some sense elsewhere than where I am at the present time. But I think what you could argue is that I am able to demonstrate my ability, my agency, in using new media to project, um, in some sense, something I think about or something that I've seen or something I think might be interesting for somebody else, so that I have the, the ability to communicate with other people at a distance. But I don't think it makes me <laughs> more distributed than I am at the present time. Fair enough. Um, I don't mean to change anyone's mind. Um, what, what I would like to say again is, certainly you can view it as, I have a Facebook page, I remain essentially stable. 
I put. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. okay. How about that then? Sure. Um, that yes, that's certainly a legitimate way to view the situation. What I'd like to suggest is it's possible to view things a different way. And again, what I'm not arguing for here is supremacy or truth. Um, perhaps what I'm arguing, arguing here uh, for is legitimacy of alternatives. If we view things your way, we get certain productive elements. If we view it another way, we get different productive elements. Really, I mean, at its core, I see this as, as highly non-controversial. Um, perhaps I'm mistaken in that. Uh, it's in a, just a variation of the previous comments, I think. Uh, but um, it, it, it is surely a fallacy to argue that um, who I am, if who I am, depend on my relation to uh, objects around me. Um, uh, it follows that I have a distributed self. Uh, that 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 would be a fallacy. Uh, so because I mean, yeah. everything everything depends on uh, relations to other things, and that doesn't mean that the object itself is dis distributed. So, and so I'm just curious what it, it concretely uh, uh, means to have a distributed self. I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking of the Chalmers idea with the extended mind. Uh, uh -huh. It talks about. Um, uh, calculators or uh, stuff like that takes epistemic credit for cognition, for example. And that would be, a, I'm not sure if I agree with that idea, but um, in the case of uh, Sims and so on, I would I try to ask what is it about the distributive relation which uh, makes it valid to make a claim about a dis distributed mind? Do, do you understand? Uh, my question? Um, perhaps. What is it about distributed cognition, as in incorporating the environment into acts of, of cognition, that therefore allows you to view things as um, distributed mind, as a distributed mind or a distributed identity? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my, my response to that would be: um, you'd have to accept the premises that um, identity is exceedingly tightly, if not wholly, bound to our acts of cognition. You'd have to accept that as a premise that what we uh, are is what we do. Um, I personally tend to buy that, but you don't have to, right? But I, I, I think if I understand your question, there is a little bit of a chasm there that you have to cross, right? Just because I can use a piece of paper and write down a little bit, that doesn't necessarily mean that my mind is out there, right? If I understand you, you correctly. Um, yeah. My position on that would be, well, what I call myself is, is based in those acts, it's, uh, those very kind of acts. It's based in those things. That's where my identity comes from. Um, but you're right, I mean, it doesn't function if you don't accept that kind of premises, that, that kind of combining of cognition with identity. Okay. Thanks. Uh, right. I know the people want to ask you more things, but we will have a five minutes break now, so the questions can be done there. Thanks a lot. Thank you all.